Most of us who have heard of James Prescott Jewell have heard of him because of Jewell's Law, his paddle experiment, and or we know that energy is measured in joules in his honor. But who was James Jewell? Why and how did he make his discoveries? How were they accepted or rejected by the general public? And what does it have to do with his friendship with a man named William Thompson, who's later knighted Lord Kelvin like the temperature? Ready for the story? Let's go! Electricity, 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 electricity. James Prescott Jewell was born on Christmas Eve in 1818 in South Ford, England, which is near Manchester. James was the grandson of William Jewell, who had founded a popular brewery called Jewell's Beer, which James's father ran after his grandfather's death. James was prevented from going to school because he had a weak spine. His spine problems didn't stop him from enjoying rowing, riding horses, and playing electric tricks including recreating Benjamin Franklin's electric kite experiment for fun. In 1834, the Jewell brothers were tutored by the now famous chemist John Dalton, who popularized the idea of atoms in chemistry. By the time James Jewell was 18 years old, Jewell worked at the brewery seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., but still found time to tinker with experiments in a spare room in his father's house. It was around this time that Jewell learned about electric motors and was inspired. See, a former shoemaker and soldier named William Sturgeon, who had invented the electromagnet in 1826, started to have trouble getting published, so he started his own electricity magazine. In Sturgeon's first publication in October of 1836, Sturgeon published a description of a motor he had made with electromagnets, which he claimed could be used for, quote, drawing water wagons and carriages on the railway, and upon the same scale we see pieces of machinery put into motion by large models of steam engines. In retrospect, it seems clear that Sturgeon was exaggerating the power of his motor, and his motor could barely spin, let alone being on the same scale as steam engines. It motivated Jewell and much of England to try their hand at inventing their own electric motors. Secondly, the following year, Sturgeon published the account from a Russian-German man named Moritz Jacobi, who had designed a better motor than Sturgeon and published it first as well. Jacobi not only made the world's most powerful motor, he also wrote a paper with Sturgeon translated in 1837 that described Ohm's law in a simple and convincing way, which is how Joule learned of it. Joule then used those ideas to create his own motor, and published a description of it when he was only 19 years old in Sturgeon paper in February of 1838. Jewell was initially convinced that electric motors would be very powerful very soon, writing, quote, I can scarcely doubt that electromagnetism will eventually be substituted for steam and propelling machinery. Jewell therefore designed system after system, but he quickly became frustrated that his motors weren't very powerful or very fast. He then decided that he needed to have a machine to measure the current, something called a galvometer, that was more precise, that had units that he could depend on, because all of the systems before that were uncalibrated. It was these studies that led Joule to realize that he could use Faraday's new law of electrolysis to quantitatively measure how much electricity was produced by how much hydrogen was decomposed. With this more accurate measurement device, Joule decided to measure how much heat electricity produced, and by 1840 had determined that the heat produced by a wire is proportional to the resistance of the conductor multiplied by the square of electric intensity. This equation, known as Joule's law, is still commonly used today. Joule then started doing more and more experiments about heat and realized that the chemical energy he was getting from the battery was equal to the amount of heat he was producing from the heated wire. He then became convinced that heat was not an indestructible caloric, as most people thought at the time, but instead was something that could be created by work, or in reverse, heat could be used to do work. By August of 1843, Joule was trying to convince anyone and everyone that Quote, wherever mechanical force is expended, an exact equivalent of heat is always obtained. As Joule was describing how heat transfers, 
This was eventually called a law of thermodynamics. Thermo is heat, dynamics is motion. However, Joule's results were so precise that many scientists doubted him. Also, he was promoting the idea of atoms, that heat was just the motion of molecules, and that was widely ridiculed. Plus, he was just a beer brewer, and they didn't want to listen to him. Undeterred, Joule continued to give talks about conservation of energy to various uninterested parties. By June of 1845, he created his most famous experiment, the paddle wheel. In this experiment, he dropped a weight from a height, which then turns a paddle, which would heat up the water. And then he could find the relationship between what we now call the potential energy of the weight and the temperature change in the water. In this way, he found that 817 pounds at a height of one foot was equivalent to raising the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit, which is about 4,400 joules per calorie in current units. Side note, he made a more accurate experiment in 1849 and got a weight of 772.692 pounds, which corresponds with 4,160 joules per calorie in modern units. Anyway, on June 23rd, 1847, Joule gave a talk for the British Association of the Advancement of Science, where a 23-year-old Scottish scientist named William Thompson heard him. Years later, Thompson recalled that when he first heard the talk, he felt strongly impelled to rise and say that it must be wrong because it opposed the writings of a French scientist named Saadi Carnot. However, as Thompson listened to the talk, he realized that at least some of what Jules said was, quote, a great truth and a great discovery. They met after the talk, and Thompson said that it quickly ripened into a lifelong friendship. This friendship became a family affair when a week after the talk, James Jewell married a woman named Amelia Grimes, and William Thompson accidentally bumped into them conducting science experiments on their honeymoon, which he was invited to join. The experiment, not the honeymoon. This is an important friendship because the next year, Thompson became internationally famous when he published How to Use Saudi Carnot's Theories to Derive Absolute Zero Temperature, which he derived to be negative 273 degrees Celsius. This is why the temperature scale is measured in Kelvins in his honor. He was knighted and made Lord Kelvin in 1892. In this paper, Thompson said that the idea of an indestructible heat was a view, quote, nearly universally held, except by Mr. Joule who had made, according to Thompson, some very remarkable discoveries on the subject. In Germany, a 27-year-old high school teacher named Rudolf Clausius read Thompson and then Joule and then others and was inspired by everything except for the idea that heat was indestructible. Instead, Clausius felt that heat is a form of energy and is the energy that is conserved, partially because of what he called the careful experiments of Joule. Thompson really hated Clausius's paper, and soon Thompson and Clausius published articles debating each other's ideas. In addition, Thompson changed his mind about the calorific and published a series of five papers on the dynamical theory of heat, which used Joule's results to lay out new mathematics and theories on the conservation of energy and the laws of thermodynamics. At first, this was a happy time in Joule's life, his ideas were being accepted by scientists in the scientific community. His marriage to Amelia was strong with the birth of two children, Benjamin in 1850 and Alice in 1852. All of this changed in 1854 when Amelia had a very difficult time giving birth to their third child who died 20 days later. By July of 1854, Jewell wrote Thompson about the tragic news and that he was, quote, very much alarmed about my dear wife, who was not recovering well. She died two months later. Jewel was devastated, quit his scientific work, and moved with his children back to his father's house. With love and support of his family, Jewel started to recover and regain interest in scientific work. By the next year, 1855, Thompson convinced Jewel to continue his studies in electrodynamics. 
as well as fluids, but he was never quite the same. Jules started receiving awards for his work and was awarded an honorary doctorate. In 1863, he was added to the British Association's Committee on Electrical Standard, where he helped Thompson and others to name and standardize the units of current, charge, voltage, and resistance. And in 1867, the report stated that the most important experiments have been those conducted by Dr. Jewell. In 1882, the president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science suggested that energy should be measured in joules in honor of James Jewell, which we continue to do to this day. James Jewell died seven years later at the age of 70, and his grave has the number 772.55, for his final measurement for the weight in pounds to heat one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So that was a little background on James Prescott Jewell. It was very interesting for me to look at the 1863 Committee on Electrical Standards, as there's not only William Thompson and James Jewell, but also James Clerk Maxwell, who I have a video about, Charles Wheatstone, who I just finished a video about, and Balfour Stewart, who I mention a lot in my video about Norman Lockyer. In addition, the committee included the scientists Carl Siemens and Cromwell Varley, whose brothers Ernst Siemens and Samuel Varley, along with Charles Wheatstone, all claimed to have independently and nearly simultaneously invented the self-exciting generator. I go over a bit of that controversy in my video about the history of the generator. However, in that video, I make a significant mistake. I kind of implied in that video that Tesla invented the modern three-phase electrical system. I implied that because I thought he had. However, I studied it and I found out that that's not the true story. How three-phase electrical systems work, why it was invented, and why Tesla is often falsely given the credit for it is next time on the Lightning Tamers. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Give a thumbs up, put a comment, share it on social media. You should even, even hit that little bell thing because I don't make that many videos. You won't be bothered too much. Also, if you really want to thank me, you can join my Patreon and then you get videos a day early. You get chapters from my new book early. You get all sorts of goodies and you get my everlasting thanks and what's better than that. Okay, well you stay safe out there. Bye. Jewel therefore designed system as the Jewel therefore designed system after system, but he keep the